Our God shall come and shall not keep silence. A fire shall devour before him, and it shall be very tempestuous round about him. Our God's a coming. Our God's a coming. He's on the way. He's on the way. He's not going to be silent. The Bible says, hey, man, what are we waiting for? We're waiting for the trump of God and the shout of God. There's going to be a vo voice crying out loud, and when God comes, he will not keep silence. One of the problems in the church today is people mistake God's silence for stupidity and ignorance. God's stupid. God's cool with my sin. He ain't said nothing about it yet. I had one guy tell me when I confronted him on his three major sins, one of them was fornication, living with a woman who wasn't his wife. I told him that that was sin. He goes, you know, that's kind of weird because the Holy Spirit has just never convicted me about that one yet. And it's all through the Bible from the beginning to the end how God despises it, how he hates it, how he's going to bring a crush down on it. And in Deuteronomy, when you read Deuteronomy, they are supposed to be killed for it. Aren't you thankful for the days of grace? And people mistake God's silence for his okay. I'm cool with your sin. Oh, just oh, just go love everybody, and yes, I'll just cover everything. And that's not the case. Guys, why he is silent is because he's giving you another opportunity in his long suffering to repent. The Bible says the fool speaks all his heart, but the wise holdeth it till afterwards. God will never pronounce judgment on you till it's time to pronounce judgment on you. Till then he will remain silent. And guys, the very next thing on God's timeline is the trumpet of God and the shout, the, the shout of the archangel, the shout of God. And when that happens, that means the door closes. And that means there's no more grace. There's no more time. The judgment has begun. And that's why he tells us right now, judgment begins in the house of the Lord. If you will judge yourself right now at this very moment, based on the word of God, because God the judge wrote the Bible and gave it to us. So if we will listen to the judge, judge our hearts in, in the silence of our quiet place and listen to him tell me what is wrong with me, what is right with me. That's why we read the Bible daily. That's why we don't like the word of faith people just follow spirit. Their whole thing today is, I just follow spirit. Wherever spirit t takes me, tells me what to do, I just follow spirit. Yeah, but do you read your Bible? No, I don't need to do that because I follow spirit. I'm here to tell you guys, when you're following a spirit and ain't reading that Bible, you're following a false spirit, not the Holy Spirit of God. He may act like the Holy Spirit for quite some time, but then he's going to take you off the course that God designed for you. And that's why we read the Bible daily, because the Bible keeps us on course. It'll always show me where I messed up. It's a mirror. Don't you stand in front of a mirror when you get ready in the morning? Why? Because you want to take care of obstacles that are there, that are going to hinder your day. You want to clean up where you need cleaning up. You want to fix that hairdo where you need to fix that hairdo. You want to adjust your makeup properly. You want to walk out the house properly, and you have to have the mirror showing you what you really look like before that happens. The Bible is the mirror that shows us what we really look like. And when people don't look into the mirror, they don't know exactly what they look like in the eyes of God. And guys, that's the most important vantage. You must know how you look in the eyes of God. And that's why God gave us his word, so I would know how I look in the eyes of God. And I always want to straighten out where I'm looking wrong, where I'm doing it wrong. I want to get rid of the bad and add the good. And it says, Jesus Christ, God himself is coming. He shall come. He will not keep silent. A fire is going to come before him. Does that sound familiar? Does that sound kind of New Testament? -y? Does that sound kind of prophetic? -y? Does that sound kind of like 30% of the Bible? It's kicking off right now. There's a fire coming before him, and it shall be very tempestuous. It shall be very rough. It shall be very hot. It will do what it set itself out to do, and that is devour things in its path all around about him. He shall call to the heavens from above and to the earth that he may judge his people. Come, my people! He can call his people. Continue on. Verse 5. Gather my saints together unto me, those that have made a covenant with me by sacrifice. Jesus Christ is that sacrifice. This was written 1,000 years before Jesus Christ came and died on a cross. He was the sacrifice, the final sacrifice. For the next thousand years, they would go down to Solomon's temple. They would go to Herod's temple. They would go to the temple and they would perform their acts of religion. They would perform their acts of sacrifice. 
and there were many people there, and th they would do their sacrifices, but it wasn't in their heart. It wasn't sacrifice at all. It was ritual. And God is looking at our hearts today, and he requires, the requirement from your heart is a sacrificial heart. What is sacrifice? Giving up something you like for something better. Giving up your opinion for God's. Giving up your direction and your game plan for what God has for you. Sacrificing what you think is important. Willing your will over to God and saying, God, here's what I've come to know. Whatever you think is important is more important than what I think is important. And I want to know and do what you think is important. I want to get in on your game plan and your schedule. And we do that. And he says, it's required by sacrifice. Jesus Christ is that final sacrifice. And we place our faith in him. We make covenant in his sacrifice. But that is not the end of the covenant. That's the beginning of the covenant. The end of the covenant is you now becoming a sacrifice, not a dead one, but a living one. And this is the covenant God is looking for his people, his chosen people, the people of God that he's going to call out and who's going to be able to escape this fire that's coming with him, this devouring, tempestuous fire. Those who will be able to escape that are the people who live in the sacrifice. Not only the sacrifice of Jesus, I believe in that, because people talk about the sacrifice without sacrifice in their heart. And God is looking at the thoughts and the intents of the heart today. I come to church every week. I sing the songs. I sing about flying away. Meanwhile, you're thinking about flying to, you know, Cancun. I'll fly away, all right, but it ain't in the heart and the sacrifice, the sacrificial heart of God. God's winning our heart at the place of sacrifice, and that's what he says right here. He says, gather ye my saints together unto me, those who are my saints, those that have made a covenant with me by sacrifice. Here's my end of the deal. I'm coming and I'm going to die for you to get you to heaven. And here will be the result, the receipt that you have received and you truly love my sacrifice. It's when you become a living sacrifice, wholly acceptable unto God. It's just your reasonable service. You're going to get saved, you're going to believe in me, and then you're going to follow and do the things that I say. God is looking for people who will produce fruit today. If you have no fruit in your life, you need to check and see whether or not you have met your end of the covenant. Jesus Christ is coming. God is coming with that shout, with that voice, with that fire to a people who are abiding and living in the covenant. The covenant he made with us through his death and burial and resurrection and the covenant we agreed upon to become living sacrifices for him because of his death, burial, and resurrection. Not calling upon our deaths, but a calling upon our lives. We are not here called to die for him, though that may be the case. We are called, first of all, to live for him as living sacrifices, producing fruit. Some 30 some 60 and some 100. And if you're not a fruit producer in this room, the fire is going to get you. You will be sawed off, your branch sawed off, and cast into the fire. You will be left here during the tribulation. You are not going in the rapture. I believe that more as I live. I didn't used to believe that. I used to believe that everybody that was saved said their little prayer. Hey, we're all good. We're all, we, got the, we got the Holy Ghost in us. He's down payment. We're all going. The Holy Ghost comes in people who live in covenant, who made a covenant with the Lord in belief. Whosoever believeth in him shall not perish. His death, his burial, his resurrection, his sacrifice. And the continuation, this tells us a thousand years before Jesus ever was sacrificed, that it's a covenant of sacrifice. His end and my end. A covenant involves two parties. I'm making a deal with you. You're making a deal with me. Jesus says it's going to be my death and your life. Deal? And I say, no. And I'm not in the covenant. I say, yeah, and I don't stick to my end of the deal. My heart never was in the decision. I never have been saved, guys. Salvation is not in my lip service, in my what I say. Salvation is what's in my heart. Out of the abundance of the heart, the mouth will say and continue to say, and those words will always lead to actions, which leads to habits, which leads to characteristics in my life, which is fruit being produced. I really have love. I don't feign it. I really have joy. I don't pretend. <laughs> I have peace. I really have a peace in my heart. That's what God is producing in our lives when we match him in covenant. His death and our life. Verse 14. Offer unto God thanksgiving and pay your vows to the Most High. We are people today who don't say what we mean. We don't mean what we say. We just answer the question real fast to get you off my back and to keep conflict from being stirred up. We like to placate. We like to downplay. We like to, if I say the truth right here, it may cause stink, so I'm just going to, you know, whitewash it with a little bit of lie here just to get you out of here. 
And we do that, and that's how we deal in America today, because we, we're all about toleration and peace. And we can't have, Jesus said, I did not come to send peace, baby. I came to send a sword, and those of you that walk in me and my covenant, you know that. And that doesn't mean I go around saying, who wants some of this, baby? What I do is I go, I walk around, and I'm like, got the sword with me, and when you come along with a bunch of fat lies, I got to cut that off. Boom. Because that ain't happening around me and mine. That's not going to happen around here. When you come believe in your own ways and your own thoughts and your own sacrifice, you're going you're gonna to write your own sacrifice covenant, what it means, and it's going to not be in line with God's sacrifice covenant. You're wrong, and I must tell you that you're wrong, and you're going to split hell wide open. And you need to come back to God and, and match his covenant, his death, with your life. Living sacrifices, holy, acceptable unto God. Guys, is that reasonable or not? The Bible says it is reasonable. It's your reasonable service. Fruit comes by way of service. Having a heart that loves God and saying, what will you have me do? And he'll say, serve, serve others in my name. Go serve people. Quit trying to be the kingpin, and you go be the servant in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. And when we do that, we follow his example. God becoming man, and he becomes the servant of all the twelve that he chose. He served them. He waited on them. He taught them. He had patience with them. He didn't always breathe out fire and, and death on them. He was very humble, very patient, very enduring with them and their stupidities. I'm so thankful for that, because I'm one of those disciples myself. When you go back, you know, we're to count our blessings, name them one by one, and it will surprise us what the Lord has done. His wonderful, awesome blessing. His blessing after blessing after blessing when I didn't deserve it. Here's the thought. Instead of you being self-righteous, why don't you go count your sins up? You go count how many times you were evil, how many times you were vile, how many times you hurt somebody, how many times you lied, how many times you lusted after somebody, how many times you undressed them with your mind, with your eyes, with your thoughts, how many times you watched this wickedness in front of your eyes via porn, via death, via rape, via everything that's anti-God. You watch that over and over. You count that up, man. It's time for us to count our curses and realize how good God's been to us. And when it's time for us to keep our end of the bargain, our end of the covenant, his death, and our life. And guys, when you do that, and you realize how much you've been forgiven, it's going to be automatic, a thankful heart. You're going to be thankful to God. You're going to be gracious, man. You're going to just say, I can't believe how good you've been to me when I was so bad. You came to me while I was bad, and you're going to have a thankful heart. You're going to thank him in good times. You're going to thank him in bad times. You're going to thank him in the middle of trouble, because in the middle of, of our troubles, when we thank him in everything, give thanks. It's the will of God in Christ Jesus concerning me. And true thanksgiving always leads to joy. True thanksgiving always leads to praise, true praise. People sing praise songs, but they don't have praise in their heart because they're ungrateful. When you are truly grateful to God for the things he's done, it'll show on your face. You'll glow like Moses coming down from the presence of God. And guys, we never come down from the presence of God. It's 24-7 with us. We get to have his spirit in us. We get the word in front of us. The mirror stays in front of our face 24-7. And what did David pray a thousand years before Jesus? He said, I will only be satisfied when I awake in your likeness. When, when I look in the mirror and all I can see is Jesus, that's when I'll be satisfied. You guys, we don't live in satisfaction right now because I don't see Jesus just yet, but I see that he's working on me. He's conforming me into the dear image of his dear son. By God's grace, isn't that a wonderful gospel? Isn't that a wonderful truth? And when you realize where you truly come from, you will quit talking about people. You will quit gossiping. You will quit using your mouth for a hole of death. You'll start bringing life out of that thing. And it begins in the quietness of your heart, you and God one-on-one, -on -one, thanking him, thanking him, counting your blessings, thanking him for his goodness to you, man. His goodness to you, his goodness to you. Lord, help me to be that good to other people that don't deserve it. You were good to me when I didn't deserve it. I want to be good to them at all times, man. I want to love my enemies. I want to forgive them. I don't want to hold any grudge. If you hold any grudge against any human being on this planet, guys, you are in trouble right now. You are breaking your into the covenant. The fire's coming. It's treacherous. It's coming. It's a consuming fire. God wants us to keep in our end and say, Lord, I'm going to follow your example. I'm going to do what you said. Satan is waiting for you to live in sin. He wants you to harbor that one sin out here. And what that does when you harbor your sin out here, it places you right under the trap, right under the snare. And the Bible says the rapture is going to be a snare to many people because they weren't ready. They weren't watching. They weren't living in their end of the covenant, their end of the bargain. And it says, offer unto God thanksgiving. It's an offering, guys. It's an offering. It's a sacrifice. That word sacrifice continues on. Pay the vows to the Most High. What is the vow? Lord, whatever you tell me, I want to do. Whatever your word says, I'm willing to change my entire life to match its course. This is the vow a Christian makes to God. 
I'm no longer choosing my way. I choose your way. What is your way? And the very first thing that comes to us is Jesus and his death, burial, resurrection on the cross. Okay, I believe that. Salvation is initiated. The Holy Spirit comes in us. And now we live in sanctification where I'm growing in the word day by day by day. And you're looking in that mirror every day, the perfect law of liberty. And he that continueth therein, he being not a forgetful hearer of the word, but a doer, this man and only this man who continues in that law of the mirror of the Lord of the blessing God will be blessed in all his deeds. Read your Bible. Pray every day. The little kids sing it. We need to live it. It's time for us to quit saying our religion and start living our religion as living sacrifices. The things we believe in the scriptures and holding up our end of the vow unto the Most High. Verse 15. And call upon me in the day of trouble. I will deliver you. You're going to glorify me. You know why? Because we praise him during good times. I don't wait till bad times to pray to him. Right? Those vow keepers. Those that love him, those that walk in his graciousness, those that walk in his favor, those that have, have met up with him at Calvary and said, Lord, I'm going to keep my end of the bargain and I'm going to be a living sacrifice. I'm always going to walk with you. I'm always going to talk with you. I'm, I need you. I need you more than my necessary food. As the heart pants after the water broke, that's how my heart pants after you, Lord. I need to drink of your living waters daily more than my necessary food. That's what Job prayed. Job knew it. Job said that without a Bible in his hand. Job said that reading the stars and thought, man, God's magnanimous. He's awesome. He's your story is awesome. I just wish it was written in a book. And God said, I'll tell you what, why don't you go ahead and author that first book? The book of Job's the oldest book of the Bible, and God had Job write the first verses in the entire Bible. Because the guy desired to have the Word of God. Guys, I hope you desire to have the Word of God in your life. And I hope you desire to keep your vows. And I hope you desire to be thankful. And I hope you're thankful while things are good. So when things are bad, you call upon the name of the Lord. You will be saved out of your trouble. And you will only glorify God when you do that. Verse 16. But unto the wicked, God saith, What hast thou to do to declare my statutes? Or that thou shouldest take my covenant in thy mouth. Wicked people, they go to church every week. Wicked people, they carry their Bibles. There's a bunch of wicked people who say they're saved. There's a bunch of wicked people who say they trust in the covenant of the Lord Jesus Christ and his death. There's a bunch of wicked people who feign madness and folly every day. You wouldn't know it from the outside, and you and I, most of the time, we won't know it until we get inside with them. They begin to talk to us, and their hearts are truly revealed. But there's many people, maybe some of you here today, who are just as fake hypocrites as hell itself. And you're going to go to hell. And when Jesus Christ, God, comes with his shout, when he comes with his fire, you are going to be outside the trap. You've put on this show, you, you've done your thing, you've been smiley and good, and you get along with everybody who's in the covenant, but you yourself are a fake and a fraud. God knows exactly who you are, man, and you're called wicked in his eyes. And God says to the wicked, what have you to do to declare my statutes, or that you should take my covenant in your mouth? You say the right things, you say you believe, but yet you don't. I see your heart. Continue on. Seeing thou hatest instructions, and you hate my Bible. You don't do what the Bible says. You never listen to the preachers. You never listen to the gospel. You shake your head and you show up and you blah, 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 blah. We hear those rocks are rattling up there, but it doesn't get past any of that. And then you won't read your Bible on Sunday afternoon or Monday morning or Tuesday or Wednesday or Thursday or Friday or Saturday. God calls you wicked if you don't like his Bible. If you will not listen to his instruction and you throw his Bible behind you. I don't need that thing. Where's the party at? That is the Christian church today in the United States of America. And the problem with that is we have influenced every Christian church in every other nation. That's why we're at the head of this thing, and that's why the head gets cut off. It's time for us to repent, people. It's time for us to be a people of the word. It's time for us to be a people who are ready to hear, receive the instruction of God, do what he says, and love his Bible reading daily. Who are the wicked? Those that don't really care about his Bible. Who are the righteous? Who are those that love him? He said, you love me when you regard my Bible higher than anything else in your life. If you regard iniquity in your heart, the Lord will not hear you. If you hide this word in your heart, you won't sin against him. There will be no iniquity hidden in your heart. There will be no open iniquity. You will hate iniquity. You will despise iniquity. That's what we learned last week. When the true grace of God saves you, he will drive you from sin. You will hate your sin. All that stuff will come out of you and you'll add faith, hope, charity, virtue, knowledge, all these things that God wants to add to our stuff. Guys, quit being wicked today. Quit following the lifestyle of the wicked. Live in your covenant. Jesus died for you. It's time for you to live for him. It's time for you to quit living for Babylon. Get out of Egypt. Get out of the sinfulness of this entire world. Get the leaven out of your house. That's sin. A little yeast puffs up the whole loaf. 
God doesn't like a little yeast. God is wants you and I to not practice sin, to not walk in sin, to hate it, to despise it. And the only way we can do that is that mirror showing us what's up, the word of God. And not to cast the words behind us. The verse just before this is, oh, we say the words of God, we sing the songs, but we don't mean it. And now he's saying he calls us wicked because we hate his instruction. We hear it and we nod our head, but we won't heed it. Instruction unheeded is foolishness. You're a fool. Remember the foolish virgins and the wise ones? The foolish ones are banging on the door saying, oh, master. And he's like, master, where are you coming from with this? Yeah, I never was your master in life. I died. I held up my end of the bargain. I rose from the dead and you never lived for me. It's only wise to live for God and him alone. That is wisdom. What separated the wise and the foolish? Wisdom. What is wisdom? The fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. The fear of the Lord, that is wisdom. Not being scared of him, but saying, hey, you know what? What you say goes. You've given me your word. I want to hear your instruction. I want to heed your instruction. I want to do what it says. I want to read this thing, man. Not throw it behind my back and where's the party at? That's the Christian church today. I encourage you. I plead with you not to be that people. I plead with you to be a people who are holy, who walk in your end of the covenant. As Jesus died for you, you live for him. Continuing on. Verse 18. When you see a thief... You're right in there with him. When you've been a part, you've also been a partaker with adultery and adulteresses and been partaker in adulteries. How do we do that? When you watch it on TV and love it. When you see it around you and you say nothing against it. When you don't speak up against sin, but you find yourself in the middle of it being all sheepish and afraid to speak up or escape. God wants us to come out from them that's where the trap is. Do you not understand that's where the trap is set? In the middle of liars, in the middle of whoremongers, in the middle of thieves? Guys, when you don't speak up against a liar, you're okay in his sin. When the liars come against you in your household and you say nothing and, and you act like it's okay, and you and I are not God in this state. We are not God in this sense. We are not tolerable. God is long-suffering and suffering. Now, you and I, there's a time to speak up and there's a time not to speak up. But everybody around me needs to know who's living in the lie that I do not stand with you in this lie. I, I am in opposition with this. I'm not in opposition with you. I love you, but I hate your lie. I hate your philosophy. I hate the way you stand. I hate it. They need to know that about me. How do they know that? Because I believe what the Bible says. And they hate the Bible. And when they hate the Bible, they'll hate those who love the Bible. When they can't stand the Bible, they'll hate the mirror that's portraying yourself, Jesus Christ, unto your image, your image unto Jesus Christ. You becoming more into his likeness. When you live by faith, when you walk in your end of the covenant, people will hate you. They, you won't get along with thieves. You won't get along with adulterers. You can't stand it. Guys, many Christians have been involved with these sins. We're all, we come from our mother's womb speaking lies. We, we are thieves. We are liars. We take that which is not ours. We plagiarize. Oh, we tell a joke, and <laughs> everybody laughs at the joke, and we never told them the source of where we got the joke. That, that simplicity of life, okay? These things, we steal everything that comes along, just like Satan stole the glory coming to God. I want that glory for me, and we are glory stealers, in that we are thieves. We've hung out with that, and we need to learn to hate that about ourselves. We need to give God everything. We need to decrease and let God increase. We need to unload our, our truck, man. I had a brother talking to me yesterday, beautiful, beautiful story. He endured he did the right thing at a church did the right thing at a church and the pastor was just not in with it man and no vision of god everywhere this kid went was the vision of god seeing his area saved low income low budget black and mexican area and these are white caucasian preachers and this kid is wanting to reach the locals because that's their lighthouse right here let's reach everybody and the preacher didn't want all that god's called this guy onto a greater and bigger blessing and he's he was sharing that with me he's now in full-time staff <coughs> in memphis he's like and I really feel nervous about it. I don't know if I'm going to be doing the right thing or not. I, I just, I got so much stress in me. Guys, there's no stress in the service of the king. All you got to do is find out what he wants you to do today and do it. If you come into Christianity like a business and have all these programs and things, you come in with way too much on your load. Because my yoke is easy, my burden is light. You come in and here's the main purpose, man. If God puts you in charge of a group of people, you invest your life in those five people who are investing their lives in each of these Sunday school segments. You invest your life in these people. You love these people. That's why we have small group here. That's why we get together. That's why we talk. That's why we pray together. Because we're investing our lives in each other as you would go out these doors and invest your life in the people you come in contact with daily. That's the Christian walk. That's the Christian talk. That is keeping our end of the covenant bargain. 
Jesus did it in death. We do it in life. We are living sacrifices. Are you holding up your end of the bargain? Do you love the Word of God? Do you love it more than a running deer needs water? Do you love it more than your necessary food if you've not eaten in three days? Do you love the Bible more than that? It's time for us to pray to come to that place in our end of the bargain, in our end of the covenant. Because God's about to come, man. Aren't you going to be thankful? Won't you be thankful? Had you done this? Won't you be thankful the day you see the other covenant keeper on his end? God always keeps his side of the covenant. Lord, aren't you going to be grateful to know that you didn't throw his word behind you? Aren't you going to be grateful to know that you had a thankful heart even in troubled times? Aren't you going to be thankful? Aren't you? Now, God did tell us there's going to be two categories of people standing there at the judgment seat of Christ. This is those who are Christian. There's going to be a bunch who have well done and good and faithful servants, and there's going to be some with shamefacedness. And they're going to have their heads bowed. They're going to meet him in shame because they didn't believe his word from the beginning to the end. I encourage you to be a people who believe. I, I, if, if the devil has beguiled you today and you beguiled your own self and you've just chosen sin, today's the day to repent. Today's the day to change. Today's the day to say, Lord, God, 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 you made this covenant with me. I made the covenant with you with my lips. Today I make this covenant with my heart. And I give you me. I sacrifice all of me. I want all of my life to be about all of you. Will you please do that today for your good? This is all for your good. God gave us his word, word for word, line on line for your good. So we'd obey his word. When you see a thief, you kind of hang out with the thief. You like what he has to what he, what he has to hide, what he has to steal. Thieves and liars hang out together, guys. And in Jesus' day, it was at the church. Remember the money changers? Remember those guys? Uh, when you've got a den of thieves, that's a place where everybody meets back up after the loot stealing. That's become the church. That's become a hangout where, where jekylls and... and and wickedness and the foxes and every evil kind of wolf and thing hangs out. It's time for us to turn this place back into a place of righteousness, a place where the holy meet, a place where those who have been saved by grace, those who keep God's end of the bargain as well as our end. We know, believing he keeps his end, and we in faith keep our end. And when we fail, when the scripture shows us, hey, you're not keeping your end, we make corrections, we confess our sin. And if we confess our sin... Oh, he's so good and faithful to forgive us our sin, to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. He corrects it as though it never happened and sets us right on course with him. And I look in that mirror and, boy, it looks more like Jesus every day. Isn't that the most beautiful thing you ever heard? That's God's way. He forgets our past. He forgets our sin. The key is for you and me to have an awareness, an acute awareness of his word, wanting to stay in line with his word, wanting to do the things he says, not wanting to throw it behind our back, not wanting to hang out with thieves, but hang out with givers. God's a giver, not a thief. To hang out with those who are uh, pure in their hearts. God, aren't you thankful that he's pure with you? He's holy with you, the bride. All he thinks about is you, the bride. He doesn't go a whore after other stuff. It's all about you. It's time for us to be all about him. It's time for us to be the faithful bride to him and not cling on to the things of the world and let other things get our, our attention and our mind and our time frames and throw the word behind us. It's time for us to stick to our end of the covenant, man, guys. It's going to be worth it for eternity. We're talking about these short few days, these short few months, these short few years here on this planet versus eternity. And the just shall live by his faith. And if we live by faith, now believing the Bible, doing what it says, your eternity will be mind-blowing. It's time for us to walk the Lamb, not thieves and adulterers. You give your mouth to evil. Your tongue frames deceit. All you do is gossip and bellyache and whine and murmur and complain. The same thing God killed everybody for in the desert on their way to the promised land. Nobody who left Egypt over the age of 20 except two dudes made it into the promised land because of their mouths. They framed a seat. Guys, when you tell a story, and at the end of that story, it has just a little bit of an opposite ending than the exact whole truth, you have just been deceitful, and you have framed deceit from a wicked heart and God calls you evil today. God is truth. Jesus said, I am the way, I am truth. He wants you and me to learn to tell, to live in, to live the truth 100% of the time. If my lifestyle forces me to not be able to tell the truth, I need to change my lifestyle to match the truth so I can tell the truth. And my yes needs to mean yes, and my no means needs to mean no, and I don't need to be lying from my mouth and framing deceit. I said 99% of the truth, and I didn't lie in everything that I said. It's what you didn't say that framed the deceit. And God says, I'm sick of that. I'm tired of that. It's time for you to tell the truth, the whole truth, nothing but the truth. We say that in court. Why? Because it's going to take place in the court of all courts when you stand before the judge. Only the truth will be revealed there. And many people who've been hiding their stuff, it's going to come out. The Bible says this. 
There is now therefore no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus, who walk not after the flesh, but who walk after the Spirit. Men are condemning themselves daily. Jesus didn't come into this world to damn people. Remember John 3, 17 and 18? We all know John 3, 16. God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son, who's ever believing in him should not perish, and that's why. For God sent not his Son into this world to damn it. He came here because it was damned. And if we would just give our lives to him, he would take us from that damnation unto glorification and justification and righteousness. And so we accept Jesus Christ, and now we live in total damnation again. We take ourselves right back to the hog wallow. We take ourselves right back to the dog vomit over and over and over again instead of taking ourselves back to the word. Guys, it's time for us to throw the dog vomit and the wallow behind us and have the word in front of us and say, Lord, I'm tired of being the fool and going back to my folly. I want to walk in righteousness, your truth. I don't want to be among thieves and deceivers and whoremongers and liars. I don't want to frame deceit with my mouth because it comes from a framed heart of wickedness. I want to have a righteous heart. I want you to change me from within. Guys, it's where are we going with this? The church, from the outside, they all look good, sound good, dress nice. Their, their words are right. They even sing the songs. They can even harmonize the songs. But their hearts are wicked. And that's what God judges. And the challenge today here today is, guys, don't have wicked hearts. Have your heart be righteous. Have your heart match the word. Have the word in you. Have the word so full that it pushes out all the wickedness and you don't want to lie and frame deceit. You only want to speak the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth because you're in love with the truth personified. His name is Jesus. You want to, your life to match him and be in him. And you want to keep your end of the bargain. His bargain was, I'll die for you, raise, and live for you, and you just live for me. And we say, yes, sir, we'll do that. Having died to ourselves. There is a death involved, but I still live. And yet not I, it's Christ lives in me. I'm crucified with Christ. I didn't die in that crucifixion. But the old spirit man me did. The old liar, the old adulterer, the old framer of evil things, the old murmurer, complainer, backbiter, the one who uses this, this mouth for negativity and bringing everybody around me down and bringing myself down and never glorifying God. I killed that guy so the new one can live. The one who can praise God, the one who can tell the truth, the one who adores truth, the one who loves the Bible, the one who loves the mirror, telling me where I'm wrong. See, the, one of the problems today, people don't like to be told they're wrong when they're wrong, guys. You and I need to be a willing participant in this, Lord. Show me where I am wrong. Show me my way. Show me my wickedness. If there be any wicked way in me, show me. Didn't David pray that 3,000 years ago? That's a great prayer to continue to pray, Lord. If there's some wicked way in me, you've got to show me. Because my wicked pride doesn't want to see wickedness in me. My pride wants to see wickedness in everybody around me. And I, I'm the great guy. I'm the hero of my story. But God... I change all that. I crucify my old hero, and you're now my hero, and I want you to be my hero, and I want to walk wholeheartedly after you. Show me what that is. And show me what I'm wrong. I want it corrected. I want it all out, and I want your righteousness to be replaced in all of my heart, in all of my life, in all of my soul, in all of my being. Can we do that, Lord? That is praying according to his will. Why? Because it's found right in Scripture. David prayed it, and others prayed it just like him. Amen. If we'll pray that, God will answer that. And wouldn't you like to meet him like that? Answer prayer. You living according to your end of the covenant? Jesus died, buried, rose for you, and you died, never having died, and you live for him? That's the covenant. Live in that covenant today. That's the covenant we made with him as believers. This is our covenant. But you give your mouth to evil, you wicked folks. You, you use your tongue to frame deceit over and over and over again. You sit and speak against your brother. You slander your own mother's son. Now, you know, Adam is your father, and Eve is your mother. Humans. You should never be slandering, cutting down human beings. Now, there are going to be people in your way who are slanders, and we're going to have to discuss this in discipleship. We're going to have to get some things right, and when he said this, he shouldn't have said this. Then we're going to have to get things right. But we don't need to turn that conversation into sinfulness. We don't need to turn that conversation into where we're judging them, slamming them, and there's no hope for them. There is correction, and correction needs to be made. Somebody comes to me in counsel all the time. Hey, i got this going on, a guy at work, he does this, and, he, and we're, we're not... We're not negating this guy. We're not cut, cut, uh, crushing him down. We're not speaking against him as one of our brothers and sisters. We're saying, how can we correct this guy? Because love equals correction. Dude, you ain't looking nothing like Jesus in the middle of this. You need to look like Jesus in the middle of this. And we come to people with correction. Brethren, if a man's overtaken in a fault, he's sinning. You who are spiritual, this is Ephesians chapter 6, verse 1. You who are spiritual, restore them in a spirit of meekness, considering your own self, lest you be tempted too. So, when there's negativity around us, instead of joining in on the negative talk, yeah, he's this, she's this, she does this, he, he does that, I can't believe that, 
we sit there and we, we have to discuss what's going on, the corrections that need to be made. We pray over them and I send you out to go make that correction or I go out and have to make my own corrections. This is where it ends. We don't slander these people unto death. We don't cut them down. We don't talk about them. We don't slander our own mother's son. We don't speak against our brother. We just speak the truth about him unto correction. Everybody following that line of reasoning? We don't bring him down, bring him down. Because all that does is elevate me. Anytime I elevate me, I am lowering Christ Jesus. The, the rule is he must increase, I must decrease. And I never decrease when I'm talking bad about somebody else. I'm only trying to make myself built up in front of everybody's eyes when I'm placating or bringing down somebody. We don't need to bring down anybody, man. God calls that wickedness. He calls it evil. He calls it vile. We are to pray for those who despitefully use us, persecute us, say all manner of evil against us falsely. We're to pray and curse not. Bless and curse not. What is the definition of blessing? Someone needs to always feel loved, valued, appreciated, and have a sense of belonging, a major sense that they belong around me. And that needs to be in my conversation about them when they're not in my presence. I grew up in a Christianity where, <laughs> and then when they all leave, you just butcher them up with steak knives. Let's, let's have dinner. Let, let's, let's eat the preacher. Let's eat the deacons. Let's eat their wives. Let's destroy everybody. Blah, 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 blah. Guzzling this up. The Bible says that's a, a whorish woman. The heart of a whorish woman, an adulteress, she will eat a man alive, destroy his life. And when she's done destroying his life, she'll wipe her face and go, I've done nothing wrong here. And head on to the next one. That's what we do when we talk negatively about people and we don't think we've done anything wrong here. Because God the Father, the Father of all, the Father of Adam and the Father of Eve, the Father of my brother and sister who I choose to slander and cut down and destroy, is listening. And it's breaking his heart. And he's angry. And just because he's quiet about it, don't you think he's cool with it? Yeah, uh, they're so unrighteous, Lord, and I'm righteous. He's coming back and he's about to make some noise. And his noise is going to be against everybody who's gone against his word. That's why I implore you to get into his Bible and know what he's saying and live accordingly. 20 chapters a day, at least 10. Read that thing, know that thing, hide that thing, share that thing, walk that thing, be that thing, live that thing. The word of God, the power of God in you. And be following the Holy Spirit who guides you in all truth of that truth. And it says, man, you, you're using your mouth to destroy people instead of bless people. Verse 21. These things you've done. I've been silent. But you got to know that I was altogether such as one as thyself. But I'm about to bring it. I'm going to reprove you and set them in order before your eyes. Every crooked person, God's going to straighten you out, boy. Guys, the judgment begins in the house of the Lord. We need to let the Word of God straighten us out daily. It's going to be a whole lot better for the obedient Christian to be straight. We all need straightening out. Right here. Starts right here. The guy who reads the Bible, who encourages you to read the Bible, I need straightening out daily. And it's important that I humble myself before the Lord and allow Him to straighten me because everybody will be straightened out. It's best to straighten yourself out a little bit at a time as the Lord reveals it to you. You know, when the children of Israel went into the Promised Land, He said, when you go in and rid the entire land, I don't want you to rid it all at one time. Because if you read it all at one time, you're going to ruin the land. Do it little by little by little. Drive this bunch out, take over their farms, raise their farms right, correct all the houses, da da da. Then you get that settlement going, then go into the next area. Do the same thing. Drive out the inhabitants. You've got to do it little by little by little because if you do it all at once, it's going to become a, a, a vast wasteland. The, the, the weeds will take over, man. The foxes will take over. All the animals will come in and you won't be able to control it. But little by little by little, take care of this mess. That's how we need to do in our lives. Every day, God shows us an area, uh, an enemy that needs to be conquered. And we come in and we say, Lord, God, help me with this. And we drive that enemy out, the sin that we have in our heart. God shows it to us, reveals it to us. That enemy, that giant has got to go. I'm David and that giant is dead. And we believe the Lord who defied the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. And you, you use me to be your mouthpiece, evil one, devil, Satan, a wicked heart. I no longer want to be your mouthpiece. I want to be the mouthpiece of righteousness and joy and love and God's graciousness, man. I drive you out in the name of Jesus Christ. And we push that out through the word. It's best to do that on a daily basis than to meet up with God and have him do it all at once. Because he's going to straighten out every crooked thing and it's going to be all at once. And remember this whole premise started with a treacherous, tormentious fire that's coming along with his voice. 
We need to let that fire settle us now and get the dross out a little bit at a time daily. That's how God prefers to work in our lives. Daily obedience, daily concern, daily taking care of the problem. And these things you've done, wicked people, I kept silence and you thought through my silence that I was just a dumb dumb and I was simple minded and I was winking at your sin and I was cool with it. I have never been cool with it. My, if you had read my Bible, you would have known that. And he thought that I was altogether such, such just like you. Oh, God's just like one of us. He's cool. He puts up with it. You know, we, we got to bend. We, we got we to be nice folks. We, we got to put up with stuff. You think I'm just like you? God says, I'm nothing like you. One of the fallacies is you think I'm like you. Those of you that don't read your Bible, he's just one of the boys. God ain't one of the boys. He's holy. He's righteous. He's uplifted. He's by himself. And he's called us unto him. He's called us unto where he is. He's not one of the boys, but he's called us to be unto him. When we get to thinking, oh, he's just one of the guys, and man, Christian songs in the in the past, you know, just downplaying Jesus and who he is and, and stuff. Just, oh, he's my buddy, he's my friend, JC's up in the house, you know. Is he? Jesus Christ. Is he? Is he? Sung by people of the word of faith who don't even follow the Spirit, the Holy Spirit of God and reading his word singing this stuff, and we go right along with them, and we downplay Jesus. He's just one of the boys. This is the God of the entire universe. Folks. We need to humble ourselves. He's the King of kings and Lord of lords. Every king on this planet Earth is going to come to him. He's going to straighten them out, and they're going to bow before him, man. And they're going to kneel. Every tongue will confess that he's Lord to the glory of God the Father. Every knee will bend. Guys, and we do that on a daily basis. God wants us doing that little by little by little as he's conquering areas in our lives. He's conquering the land of you. And he's using you to do it. Drive out the enemy. Go to prayer. Let him straighten you out daily because he's going to straighten out everyone. Amen. It's best to do it daily and be working with him in the covenant as you do it. I will reprove thee and set them in order before my eyes. God sees everything. There's not one thing he does not see. And that includes the intention of your heart. The Eddie Haskells of the world are in trouble. Hello, Mrs. Cleaver. Hello, Mr. Cleaver. Why, I was just telling Beaver how much I love Beaver. He was in the middle of giving him a nookie when they walked in. <laughs> Liar, he just smile. Jesus knows the truth, just like the audience in that little TV show did. Jesus is the audience. He's watching everything we do. He knows our hearts. He knows our intents. Why don't we just go ahead and walk in obedience with all that and just make what he sees a good thing? Something that he doesn't have to reprove in the end, but he's reproved slowly along the way, and we've gotten right until we look up in that looking glass and there's Jesus sitting there looking at me. I will be satisfied when I awake in his likeness. That needs to be our heart every day. He says, I'm going to make everything in order that I see that he's made in order. Now consider this, ye that forget God, lest I tear you into pieces and there's going to be nobody to deliver you. Listen to what I'm about to say next. Because if you don't listen to what I'm about to say next, I will destroy you. I will rip you into pieces. There will be nobody to help you when I come after you. Listen to what I say next. Whoso offereth praise glorifies me. And to him that orders his conversation aright, I will show the salvation of God. God says, you got to learn to have a heart of gratitude and be thankful for everything because you can't have praise without thanksgiving. It all begins, I will enter his gates with thanksgiving and his court with praise. You can't enter his court with praise without being grateful for everything. Not complaining, not whining, not bellyaching. And he says, if you'll turn your mouth, all your words, into praise and thanksgiving instead of slander and murmuring and complaining, da da da, da I will have mercy on you. And he says, and I will show you the salvation of God. When will God show the salvation? What is the ultimate salvation? When Paul refers to the redemption of man, he's referring to the rapture. He's referring to those who are caught up in the covenant. He's referring to those who were in the right place at the right time. The bride who was in her bed when the bridegroom showed up and her gown was next to her, pressed and clean and white and ready to ride. Whoso offered praise glorifieth me. Praise from a thankful heart. Praise from a heart that is pure and not filled with guile and bitterness and anger and clamor and evil speaking and lies and jest and filthy talk and filthy communication. Let no filthy communication proceed out of your mouth, but that which is good to the use of edifying, that it may minister grace unto those who are hearing you talk. That needs to be our lifestyle. And who's going to be saved in that day? People whose mouths have been saved because their hearts truly were. People who 
know the covenant of God, who agreed with the covenant of God, and kept their end of the covenant of God. Why? Because God works in you daily to make sure you keep it. God wants you to keep the covenant. Bless you. He's not, he's not waiting for you to mess up on your covenant so he can slaughter you and straighten you out. He comes along in love while you are sinning still, even as a Christian. Even as a covenant maker and becoming a covenant breaker, he comes to you slowly and says, no, 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 let's, let's get you all the rewards here in the end. Let's get you all five crowns. Let's get you 100% fruit. We've got to straighten some things out today. Watch your mouth. Keep your mouth safe. Whatever the Lord has pointed that finger in your face today, get it corrected. Do it. Drive out the devils. Don't let them come back in. Slowly but surely, fill that land up with goodness. We let it bear fruit in this little area, then we'll go on to the next area. Drive out the devil. Drive out the enemies. Drive out the demons. Drive out your wicked, wicked heart. And allow God to purify your heart. Blessed are the pure in heart. For they shall what? See God. You looking forward to seeing God? <clears throat> Wicked hearts will not do it. Pure hearts will. Today is the day. He'll do it with a decision. Wait, Lord, God, please, I want to have a pure heart. I want you to drive everything out of me. He'll do it today based on your prayer and your realness when you pray that. You're re covenant. You're re engaging. You're rededicating in the covenant. Lord, God, please, I want to keep up my end of the covenant today. Please help me keep up my end of the covenant. Do you know if you pray, God, please help me keep up my end of the covenant? You know what he's going to do? He's going to help you keep up your end of the covenant because he wants to bless you with everything. He wants you to rule with him over many things. You've been faithful over a few. He'll help you be faithful over a few. You and I can't be faithful over a few things without his help keeping us faithful. It's all about him from beginning to end. While I was a sinner and while I was a saint, when I was a covenant maker and when I was a covenant breaker, it's all about him coming to me and me listening to his voice, not hardening my heart and saying, Lord, I want a pure heart. Give me a pure heart. And they that have pure hearts are only they who will see God. When you see God, there was a group that came to people and said, we heard about Jesus. We want to see Jesus. King James says, we would see Jesus. Is that your heart today? Is your desire to see Jesus more than anything else? Let me tell you this. If your desire is to see Jesus more than anything else, it's because God has purified your heart. If your desire, your craving, your unction, your burning fever is not to see Jesus, <clears throat> you have wickedness in your heart that needs driven out. And it needs to happen now. In the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, listen to what he says. Who are going to be those that I bless? Who are those that I'm not going to destroy? Who are those I'm not going to reprove with fire? Those that have holy hearts, who thank me, who praise me, who live in joy in my presence, and don't use their mouths for evil, but they use their mouths to bring you glory, love, honor, and praise, and to bless everybody who's been made in his image, the sons of Adam and Eve who very well happen to be your brother and your sister. Live with pure hearts, live with righteousness, and today you will not harden your hearts. You will see that.